Yeah. yeah. And now, now we see uh, our chief guest, uh, Mr. Gerd Muller. Welcome, sir. Hi. So our chairman, Mr. S.K. Mishra, is on the screen. And so is Dr. Noshad Forbes, also a member of our board. And your own colleague, Rene, is also there. Mr. Muller, uh, Rene is also there on, on the screen. Good afternoon. You started. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> so, let's start. Let's go on. Yeah, we have two minutes. Uh, so, in two minutes uh, we'll be starting. Uh, Ah, yeah, yeah, it's um, two minutes. We are yes. uh, early. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, who is with us? Who are the participants? Uh, part here? Participants are actually uh, from a cross section of academics and uh, you know government uh, policy makers and some businessmen. A very distinguished businessman from India and Mr. Dr. Noshad Forbes is on the screen. Okay. He, he is co-chairman of a, a you know Forbes Marshall company, and he was earlier president of CII, Confederation of Indian Industry. I don't know if you have heard of. It's a major business grouping in India. Yeah, well, okay, Mr. Ambani uh, is uh, participating. <laughs> Mr. Oh, yes. Mr. Oh, Ambani is too big <laughs> for, for us. Correct, <laughs> correct. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. And I want to also introduce you, uh, DG, uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, Professor VK Malhotra. He is member secretary of uh, Indian Council of Social Science Research and also a very distinguished member of our board. Uh, he is mm -hmm. online also now. Uh, Professor Malhotra. Thank you, Nagesh. And uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mueller. Uh, uh, is it's going to be 5 p.m. in so, India. So now, in now, now we are, we are, you know, it's a 5 p.m. So we should start. Yes. And I also want to welcome Ms. Sumita Davra, the additional secretary in Ministry of Industry, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Chairman uh, Mr. Mishra, uh, Mr. Gerd Muller, Director General of UNIDO, Professor V.K. Malhotra, Member Secretary of ICSSR, Ms. Sumita Davra, Additional Secretary in DPIIT uh, in the Ministry of uh, Commerce and Industry in Government of India, Dr. Noshad Forbes, Co-Chairman of Forbes Marshall and a member of ISID Board. All the very distinguished uh, friends uh, joining us on Zoom as well as on YouTube platforms. It's a privilege to welcome you to the ISID's 22 <laughs> or 22nd uh, Foundation Day Lecture on Industrial Strategy for the Post-Pandemic Era. Scaling up the inclusive and sustainable manufacturing transformation. Inclusive and sustainable manufacturing transformation is the critical need of the hour for India at this current juncture, as the economy recovers from a once in a century shock of the COVID pandemic. And India is currently moving in a very decisive manner to catch up with the potential of manufacturing with programs like Make in India, Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, and uh, schemes like production link incentives, which I'm sure uh, uh, our panelist, uh, Ms. Sumita Daura, will talk about later. Uh, and so, in, in that context, I think it's a very, very, very timely theme. And I'm sure we will all benefit from the insightful thoughts of D.G. Muller of UNIDO and other very distinguished speakers this evening. Without any further ado, uh, let me invite uh, our chairman, Mr. S.K. Mishra, to uh, deliver his welcome remarks. 
Over to you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Gerd Miller, Professor Malhotra, my distinguished colleague in ISID, Ms. Sumitra Davra, Dr. Narsad Ops, another distinguished colleague recently joined in ISID. Ladies and gentlemen, I extend a warm welcome to you to the ISID's 2022 Foundation Day Lecture. As you may know, ISID as an institution was registered in October 1986, but it became functional after having won the recognition from the, from the Indian Council of Social Science Research on 1st May 1988. Hence, we celebrate the Foundation Day of the Institute with a lecture delivered by an eminent person every year on the 1st of May or a day in the month of May, depending upon the convenience of the speaker. Over the years, we have had lectures delivered by a number of eminent speakers in this series, including former Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, former members of the Planning Commission, including Professor C. H. Hanumantha Rao, Professor G. S. Bhalla, Sri Nathan Desai, former Minister Sri Mohan Dharia, then Vice Chairman of Niti Ayog, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, and Chairman Maruti Suzuki India Limited, Mr. R. C. Bhargava. On the Foundation Day event, let me begin by paying my tribute to the memory of our founder, late Professor S. K. Goel, who envisaged the ISID as a center of excellence dedicated to policy research on industrial development of India. Over time, the, the Institute has gradually expanded the focus of its research encompassing larger issues of industrialization, such as structural transformation and decent job creation, MSMEs and startups, foreign direct investment, trade competitiveness, technology and innovation, besides issues relating to corporate governance and competition policy in India. The central agenda of policy discussions at the current juncture is to identify policy lessons for harnessing the potential of manufacturing in the country for decent job creation and foster inclusive growth. India cannot conceive of an inclusive, <coughs> of an inclusive growth without transforming a vast section of underemployed mass trapped in low productivity jobs in agriculture or in the urban informal sector to gainful employment in productive industrial activities. Reaping the demographic dividend in India requires a faster growth of manufacturing that can easily absorb the huge labor force released from agriculture. In a globalized world, this simply means creating industries that are capable of competing in the local and global markets. In today's world, with the threats of climate change looming large, it is also important not only to think of industrial growth, but an industrial development that is ecologically sustainable. We need to build our industrial capacities on these lines and also drive the process of industrialization through strategies and policies, ensuring a sustainable and more equitable distribution of income. In this context, the theme of today's lecture, namely industrial strategy for the post-pandemic era, scaling of inclusive and sustainable manufacturing transformation is very timely. We are eager to listen to the views of Mr. Gerd Muller, the Director General of UNIDO on this theme, whom I have an immense pleasure to welcome. Mr. Muller has had a rich experience in national and multilateral, uh, multilateral platforms for development having served as a federal minister for economic cooperation and development in the German government and as a member of the European Parliament. In his current role as a director general at UNIDO, since December 2021, he spearheads the specialized agency of the United Nations that promotes industrial development for poverty reduction, inclusive globalization, and environmental sustainability. I am sure that DG Muller's insights on tapping the potential of manufacturing 
around the developing world will be helpful for framing our own industrial strategy as we pursue the Make in India program and seek to foster inclusive and sustainable development. With these few words, I welcome everyone once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for setting the tone of today's uh, deliberations. Now, it is my honor to invite uh, Professor V.K. Malhotra, uh, the member secretary of uh, ICSSR, to deliver his uh, opening remarks. Professor Malhotra, please. Hello, Professor Malotra was uh, here in a minute, uh, minute ago. I don't know. If he just he has, disconnected, sir. Maybe he has uh, lost the connection. Uh, so, in that case, I think uh, may maybe I just uh, move on and uh, invite uh, our chief guest for today, uh, Ms. Gerd Muller. Uh, the Director General of UNIDO to deliver his uh, lecture, the very uh, distinguished lecture for today. And, and the theme is industrial strategy for the post pandemic era, scaling up the inclusive and sustainable manufacturing transformation. So Mr. Muller, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kumar, distinguished guests. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure and I'm very pleased to uh, present today's Foundation Day Lecture for the Institute for Studies in Industrial Development. So I think uh, back uh, my visits in your uh, wonderful uh, country and um, the first question is, are we uh, really in a post-pandemic um, period? Is the pandemic really over? No, I see the situation in China, or yesterday I talked with some African countries, the situation is still very, very uh, serious. So, and um, thank you, India. India is the most important partner for a lot of countries in the world. Um, India is the world's pharmacy. Not only when we look at this um, pandemic, the most important producer of vaccines and medications, not only for your continent, India, it's so important for the African partners, Africa. Without vaccines from India, without medi medications, even for Europe, you are a very, very important partner. And thank you for this as a, as a German DG at the top of UNIDO, the UN Organization for Sustainable Industrial Development. So UNIDO works for an end to poverty, for the fair trade and for environmental sustainability. Fair trade. And I think about my last visit at uh, a tea plantation in the Assam uh, region in India. And I think about the situation of the women there. Um, I ask, uh, what is your wages per day? They earn about for 10 hour hard work, one dollar. So, and um, then this very prominent tea in tea from your country to uh, Germany or Europe uh, is uh, um, they will sell it in uh, Vienna um, for uh, the tenths of the price they pay for the raw resource. And that is not fair trade. That we must uh, change. We need fair value changes. Let me tell this at the beginning. Um, fairness a fair world trade market. That is very important. And our goal is to make sure that industrialization works for everyone, not only for the rich one, not only for Ambadi and Reliance, 
the owner of Reliance and other people, you know, of course, uh, for people in the rural areas, the farmers in India, um, we think and we know about the situation there. So you need to advocate evidence-based and forward-looking strategies to scale up and speed sustainable industrial development. Effective cooperation in terms of technologies, business models, financing, and partnership. My motto is progress by innovation. And India is a model. Um, I visited Bangalore. Uh, you are a high industrialized country in this area. But I know about the rural areas. And there, uh, the situation is uh, something different. You know that uh, uh, better than me. India has come a long way. It has established a strong and globally significant manufacturing base. India can fuel economic growth, economic growth and sustain socio-economic progress to achieve the SDGs. We see this in, for example, the make in India mission and the self-reliance based pandemic recovery strategy. You need a stance at India's side to achieve this vision of a thriving globally competitive India. Ladies and gentlemen, industrial development progress has stalled because of the COVID-19 poly pandemic. I uh, call it poly pandemic that was not only a health crisis. In the consequence, now we see a hunger crisis in a lot of countries, especially in African countries. Um, ILO uh, prognosed that uh, about 200 million jobs as a consequence of this poly pandemic were lost. Uh, yesterday, I talked with the ambassador of Peru. Peru was the most affected country. 300,000 people died um, um, with and uh, after um, uh, this COVID pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, therefore, industrial development progress has stalled because of the COVID-19 poly pandemic. The pandemic disrupted supply chains. Even in India, you know about this. Um, this uh, lockdown and these consequences in the rural areas for workers, it disrupted demand, key consumer markets. Restrictions disrupted manufacturing. India as a global, global pharmacy has played an important role in helping to get through the pandemic. And again, thank you for this. Thank you for this, that you are the, the main producer of uh, vaccines, not only for India. And your market was open. Your market was open for export for uh, African countries. And thank you from my point of view for this. The, the pandemic shock is having a lasting impact on industrial development. Now, the industrial development landscape has three main trends, three. The first is digitalization, and there is India at the top. You have the top engineers in the world. Industrial greening. Uh, my last visit in uh, Delhi, industrial greening and the smog situation. So I think there India is not at the top. <laughs> uh, industrial greening and rebalancing our supply and value chains. That are the three main trends. Digitalization helped countries to respond and recover from the pandemic. The pandemic increased the integration of digital technologies in business processes. So we will see this in manufacturing Two, in industry 4.0. Second, industrial greening is about the urgent need to address the human-made 
planetary crisis of climate change. Climate change, loss of nature and biodiversity and pollution. And uh, this week, um, um, there was this uh, heat wave reported in European television, heat wave in Indian parts of India and the consequences for farmers. That is uh, in some way a consequence of global climate change. There is no more time to waste to make the zero carbon and circular economy a reality. I have still no, oh, is the uh, connection still on? Yeah, it's okay. Third, we must develop and diversify global value chains. They must be more resilient and more fair. As I mentioned with the T uh, value chains from Assam to Vienna or Berlin or other global marketplaces. I'm pleased to say UNIDO is already working on practical solutions to these and other global development challenges. We work with the government of India, for India and for the region and for the world. Even with all our effort together, our progress has been too slow. We are far behind the SDG agenda. We are far behind. We need innovation and more great solidarity to reach climate resilience and eradicate poverty and hunger. Poverty and hunger. A world without hunger is possible. So, but what is missing? The political will of the leaders of the world to put it in the first place, in the first place um, for the first challenge. We can come to a solution. A world without hunger is possible. That's my first priority as new DG of UNIDO. We do have the technology, we do have the knowledge, but what is missing is this really strong political will. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in dramatic times. Energy prices are soaring with terrible consequences for economies and families, both here in India and around the world. UN Secretary General Guterres speaks of a hurricane of hunger and a collapse of the global food system, food security. As already mentioned, Mentioned COVID still has global implications for health, social development. I think about the situation of uh, girls and women, jobs, education, and the economy. And these effects will unfortunately last for a long time. So COVID and the consequences are not over. The latest report of the IPCC warns of an imminent climate catastrophe within our lifetime. The negative consequences of global warming are even worse than we feared. And we can see, you can see it in India the last uh, few weeks and months. And even in uh, a lot of African states, it's dramatically in the Sahel region and in other regions. The poorest of the poor are the hit, hit the hardest by all this. And still the gap between, that's another problem. The gap between rich and poor in the world and within our own society gets wider. Rich and poor, it gets wider, just like the gap within our societies, despite all this. I'm convinced that we can overcome these challenges. There are solutions. Solutions exist, but they need to be implemented. And we need you, we need the universities, the scientists to implement, be implemented at scale and with speed. We need to transform the market for energy efficiency. Investment in renewable energy. 
carbon capture, uh, 80% of um, uh, energy production, I think even in India, in China, in Bangladesh, in all these countries worldwide, 80% are fossil based production, energy production. And there we need a new technology, carbon capture technology. So we need innovations in politics, financing and partnership. I praise India's efforts with the perform, achieve and trade scheme for energy efficiency and scaling up solar and other renewable energy. Also India, Indian leadership on the International Solar Alliance. There is even a specific cooperation with the German government. We started it uh, five years ago, this Solar Alliance. Technology is the key. In India, UNIDA supports the facility for low carbon technology deployment. One of the key questions is, is it possible to decouple economic growth on the one hand, economic growth will happen the next uh, 10 and 20 uh, years. And on the other side, decarbonization decrease CO2 emissions. That is a key question um, for uh, the um, uh, further economy. With this, we can develop and bring to market homegrown low carbon technologies. This program runs innovation challenges. So far, 59 challenge winners are being supported and 12 innovative solutions already brought to market. Cement and steel, even very, very um, important in the infrastructure field. Cement and steel worldwide are responsible for about 10% of global energy related greenhouse gas emissions so and there we need uh, new technologies even for this sector carbon capture and other technologies of course we invest all in a change for renewable energies i remember a discussion of a few years ago with the energy minister in India, and he told me, yes, we are in favor for renewable. We invest a lot, but it is not possible to change the energy, energy system within 10 years, uh, though there will be a uh, energy production based on uh, coal, oil, and gas. And therefore, we need some technologies for carbon captures. Progress towards deep decarbonization of these sectors depends on green hydrogen technology. Uh, that is a technology for the future, of course. Moving forward, UNIDO will play a stronger role in technology transfer and investment in these areas. Globally, UNIDO has already launched the Green Hydrogen Industry Initiative. India should and must be our partner in this new uh, energy uh, technology. The hydrogen transition links green hydrogen production with use in industrial parks or zones. With India's announcement of its green hydrogen mission, UNIDA welcomes further collaboration with India on this transformative program. So UNIDA has also launched the Industrial Deep Decarbonization, Decarbonization Initiatives to create markets for low or zero carbon cement and steel. Low or zero carbon cement and steel. It's possible. So we do have the solution. My motto is progress by innovation. We can't uh, forbid uh, steel and, uh, and cement. We need it for infrastructure. But we do have um, this technology for low or zero carbon cement and steel production. India is already part of this industrial deep decarbonization initiative. And I look forward to seeing scalable pilot projects in India very soon. 
Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, progress by innovation, that is the UNIDO motto. We need progress at scale. We need innovation. We need change that goes beyond our comfort zone. Beyond our comfort zone in government, industry, business, society, in general, we can protect our climate and environment. We can end poverty with development. To do this, we must think and act outside the box. Think and act outside the box. India is a strong partner of UNIDO. And I'm very proud of our and your work together. I look forward to so much more. UNIDO and I will do all we can to make this a reality for and with India, for and with the rest of our developing and emerging economy member states. I thank you so much having this possibility for speaking and talking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mueller. I think uh, you have uh, done a very uh, interesting uh, and comprehensive uh, overview of the trends, which include uh, you know, uh, the digitalization where India is uh, moving ahead, doing very well, in, and industrial greening and rebalancing of GVCs. These actually define the uh, three major trends that have come out of or have been accelerated by the uh, COVID pandemic. And I think India needs to really uh, move ahead on each of these uh, trends. And of course, uh, as you said, solutions to all our problems, whether it is in hunger, poverty, rising inequalities, or climate change challenges, solutions exist. All we need is greater spirit of uh, partnership and, and collaboration and political will behind that. So uh, with that, I think the stage has been set for a very engaging discussion between our uh, speakers. And I now see uh, Professor Malotra is connected again. Uh, we lost you, sir, uh, when I was trying to look for you. But I want to uh, ask uh, if you would like to make your remarks now or, or later. I mean, up to you. I, I think we should leave it to the panelists right now, and then okay. I can. Then I okay, can. okay. So I'll come back to you later. So in that case, uh, I would like to turn to our two distinguished uh, panelists uh, for this session. And the first one on my list is uh, Ms. Sumita Davra, the additional secretary in department, uh, you know, responsible for industrial promotion. Uh, in the Ministry of uh, Commerce and Industries. So uh, she is a very distinguished civil servant and having uh, handled many portfolios and she knows uh, she has handled UNIDO as uh, one of the uh, portfolios in uh, her previous uh, you know, positions. So uh, she is very familiar with the work that UNIDO does. And so over to you, uh, Ms. Sumita Dawar. My greetings to uh, Mr. Gerd Mueller, the Director General UNIDO at Vienna, and to distinguished participants today. It is a pleasure for me to be addressing this August gathering and to be able to share some of the initiatives and the results uh, which have been taken in India on promoting a, an inclusive and sustainable manufacturing transformation. Uh, as uh, we are aware, the country is celebrating 75 years of independence under Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, and the Ministry of Commerce and Industry is striving to achieve our Honorable Prime Minister's vision of building a new India and Atma Nirbhar India, which is based on five pillars of intent, inclusion, innovation, infrastructure, and investment. I will shortly explain in my brief address the initiatives taken in these areas to build a self-reliant and strong industrial, uh, 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 strong support for industry in the country to make the vision into a reality. Uh, distinguished uh, participants, as uh, we are aware, a number of reforms were taken in India 
in the pre-COVID times, recent reforms have been there, like the goods and services tax in 2017, the reduction in corporate tax, making India one of the very competitive uh, countries in terms of the corporate tax structure in 2019, the consolidation of the public sector banks, the investment reforms, to name a few. And during the pandemic, India used the disruption as an opportunity as well for growth to grow and develop. And as many of us are aware that the PPE kits, uh, we were a net importer and we became a net exporter of the PPE kits during a short period of time. Ventilators were also uh, manufactured in India in thousands. As the Honorable Director General himself has stated uh, in his address, the vaccine uh, 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 initiative of India, we made our vaccines and this was uh, utilized for millions of Indians and also uh, as an humanitarian initiative, the vaccine was uh, sent to about a hundred nations abroad. So India as pharmacy of the world, as the vaccine capital of the world has, is well established and it shows our competence, our capabilities to be innovative and to scale up manufacturing. <clears throat> this, apart from this, in the post pandemic era, a series of measures have been taken, uh, reform measures which have uh, been related to bringing down cost of doing business, reducing regulatory compliances, making it easier for businesses to come into India. DPIT, that is the Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade has undertaken a number of these initiatives and supported flagship programs, such as the Prime Minister's Gati Shakti to strengthen the infrastructure for industry, Startup India to promote budding startups, Make in India to promote investments in manufacturing, holistic development of domestic products under the One District, One Product Initiative. I would now like to draw your attention to some of the recent initiatives which have brought results, uh, such as the National Single Window System. I will be limiting myself to the subjects which I am dealing with. The National Single Window System, which is a one-stop shop for approvals and clearances which are needed by investors, whether it is in government of India or in the state governments. And the National Single Window System was soft launched in September last year. And already about 5,000 approvals have been granted through the National Single Window System. This agile and change-friendly architecture supports investors from all over the world to get their clearances in a time-bound and transparent manner. Plus, during the COVID, we have set up the empowered group of secretaries to resolve cross-cutting policy issues for investors. And we have also set up the project development cells in all the ministries to handle investors and fast track investments in the country. The India Industrial Land Bank is a GIS based portal, uh, a one-stop repository of uh, industrial land bank in the country, which was again launched during the COVID time. And uh, more than 4,400 industrial parks have been brought onto the portal. And an investor sitting anywhere in the world can go to the portal, can go to the mobile app and see where industrial land is available in the sector of choice. We have also rated all our industrial parks in terms of their internal utilities, external connectivity, business support system and environmental and safety measures. This again, during the COVID time, this was achieved. And the industrial park rating system with the help of ADB was also, the report was launched in October 2021, where investors can see the top rated industrial parks in the country. The Prime Minister's Gati Shakti National Master Plan is a $1.4 trillion national infrastructure master plan for holistic infrastructure development and giving an integrated path to industrial uh, clusters in the country to improve the productivity of industry and bring down the cost of doing business. A very important initiative, in, which is driven by seven engines of roads, rails, airports, ports, mass transport, waterways, and logistics infrastructure. This is becoming a big growth engine for the economy and likely to pick up speed as we go along. 
A very important initiative taken again during the COVID times is the production linked incentive scheme. This is a scheme uh, where a government gives incentives for incremental sales from products manufactured in domestic units to encourage localization of manufacturing. And this scheme covers 14 sectors, electronics, pharma, steel, uh, food products, medical devices, telecom, um, M uh, the uh, non-conventional energy resources to mention a few. And uh, we have an outlay of 26 billion USD for this scheme over a period of five years to give an average of 5% incentive on this uh, incremental sales of the industry. Additionally, a $10 billion incentive plan has been introduced by the government of India under Semicon to promote establishment of fab display industry chip in India. And to mention the achievement under the production linked incentive scheme, the 14 schemes I mentioned earlier, over 550 applications have already been approved under 13 of the 14 schemes with an expected investment of 27 billion USD and additional production of $400 billion expected over the next five years and additional jobs of 60 lakh in the next five years. All this has been possible due to the recent reforms, the recent initiatives and the ease of doing business, which has taken India's ranking to, uh, uh, there has been to, uh, to a spectacular uh, achieve, um, improvement in the uh, doing business report of the World Bank. And like I earlier mentioned, the corporate tax reduction, uh, which brings us on par with many of the Asian and Southeast Asian countries. At the same time, our exercise of reducing and elim eliminating burdensome compliances, uh, removing redundant laws and provisions, uh, removing overlapping provisions for businesses, digitizing, simplifying processes. This has been the focus of government's process re-engineering for businesses and is expected to take us, uh, scale us, even uh, help in scaling up of the manufacturing uh, transformation at a faster rate. Now, evidence of all these interventions is the increasing foreign direct investment which India has received at record levels. Our highest foreign direct investment to the tune of $84 billion was received in last year, 21-22, which is a 38% jump from 2017-18. The FDI policy has been relaxed. The regulatory barriers have been removed. I've already mentioned a number of interventions in infrastructure. We are one of the most friendly FDI destinations in the world today. And India permits up to 100% FDI in the automatic route in most sectors. We have implemented FDI reforms across sectors such as telecom, defense, insurance, pensions, to name a few of the recent ones, civil aviation, e-commerce activities, and so on. India is expected to be uh, one of the fastest growing economies. And at the moment, it's number one, enjoys the number one rank as the fastest growing G20 economy. Also, number one rank as a smartphone data consumer, second rank in the world in terms of internet users, second rank in the world in terms of global retail index, second rank in the world in terms of global fintech adoption, third largest startup ecosystem in the world today is in India, and we have more than 100 unicorns which have been recognized. We are the third largest consumer market in the world. We are the third largest energy consumer in the world. We are the third largest economy by PPP in the world today. India is undergoing a transformation. Indian economy is undergoing a transformation at an impressive scale and pace. We have a demographic dividend, our uh, digital growth, and all the other rankings I've just mentioned. Uh, we have achieved historic exports last year. We have crossed 670 billion USD in terms of uh, merchandise and services exports in the year 21-22 alone. We had the highest GST, highest goods and services tax collection in the month of April 2022 at 22 billion USD in one month alone. That is the pace at which India is growing. That is the pace at which India is transforming. 
I wish our discussions uh, all the best today, and it's an opportune platform to capture different perspectives and to build partnerships as we go ahead on our path of growth and development. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dawra, for uh, outlining and uh, sharing the initiatives that Government of India under your uh, ministry has taken in the recent times to speed up the manufacturing transformation, in inclusive and sustainable manufacturing transformation of the country. And I think some of the schemes that you have uh, you know, talked about uh, have really shown results, PLI for instance, and uh, the kind of opportunities that are coming up are for everyone to see. And there is a global recognition of India's, you know, uh, rising or emerging prospects. The Economist uh, magazine last week carried a full issue uh, focused on India rising and all that. So I think uh, there is a, a sense of optimism all around uh, the world uh, about the uh, Indian economy doing uh, very well in the challenges that are around us. Now, with that uh, perspective, uh, let me turn to our next uh, uh, distinguished panelist for today. Uh, that is Dr. Noshad Forbes, who, uh, as I earlier mentioned, uh, is a very uh, prominent uh, industrialist and businessman, but also an academic. Uh, and uh, or, or he might be more modest to, in order to accept that, but uh, he has been writing uh, uh, regularly and uh, recently he has come out with a very well, uh, you know, sort of uh, read and talked about book, uh, The Challenge and Promise, uh, or Promise and Challenge, maybe I'm, yeah, it, there is a, a, you know, flyer on his background. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure uh, Nushad will share some insights uh, which he has gathered as a businessman, and also what he has talked about in his book. So over to you, Nosha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nagesh. And uh, good evening, good, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm going to keep my comments focused around uh, uh, the topic that we have this evening. Uh, we can talk about the book separately. Um, which is really focused around um, industrial strategy uh, and uh, industrial strategy, uh, an inclusive uh, objective and a an sustainable objective for manufacturing. So uh, I'll make one point each around each of those three. Uh, let me start with industrial strategy. Uh, you know, strategy, as everyone knows, is all about choice. It's about being clear what one will do and what one will not do. And uh, that really is a reflection, if you like, of a wider understanding of industrial policy. We used to use the phrase industrial policy quite a lot earlier on. Uh, it was, I think, probably even coined by UNIDO at some point in time. Um, and it then fell out of fashion for many years, um, is making a little bit of a comeback now, but uh, it, I think, still has essential essential meaning for us uh, in many countries. And it seems to me that industrial policy makes sense if the legacy of whatever policies one puts in place is the technical capability that one has built in one's firms. In other words, too often when industrial policy has focused on production, when industrial policy has focused on indigenization, for example, um, as the sole objective or as the prime objective, um, the net effect has been a relatively uncompetitive industrial structure. But where the industrial policy has focused on building technical capability, where it has focused on building long run competitive capability, which comes from that technical capability, it has ended up being a more effective and successful intervention. And the suggestion that I would make is that the PLI scheme, the production linked incentive scheme that um, Ms. Sumitra Daura spoke about just now, um, that that scheme will have 
will be will be successful and will be seen to be successful if the legacy of that scheme is not production but is instead the ability to compete in those areas in the long run and that ability to compete in the long run has to be an ability to compete when the incentives run out in 5 years time and when protection runs out which i hope will also be in 5 years time for those items such that one can compete then with zero tariffs in each of these areas and that will only be possible if firms use this 5 year period and these incentives to build a solid technical base if they use it to develop r&d capabilities that can actually lead then to long run industrial competitiveness because that has to be at the heart of industrial policy that has to be at the heart of any objective of fostering industrial development in a country through using policy instruments second point related to that um a few numbers Indian industry invests about 0.3% of GDP in in-house R&D. The world average is 1.5%. In other words, Indian industry needs to scale its investment in in-house R&D by a factor of 5 to match international levels. That's a real objective it's up to Indian industry. We do not need incentives for that. It's up to indian industry to scale its investments in in-house r&d by a factor of 5 to match international levels if we do that it will address many of these concerns it will lead to the kind of development of long run capabilities that we need in our firms to be competitive on a permanent basis let me move on to the next two topics uh on having inclusive manufacturing as a major objective um and i think the points that were made earlier on by mr gerd muller are very well taken they come actually from creating good well paid jobs by the million that's the number one way in which we will actually have inclusive growth as a country i would argue and many others have argued that our biggest single missed development opportunity in india is having a much smaller footprint of labor intensive manufacturing than most countries at our level of development we don't have to look far to learn from better and more successful examples we just need to look at bangladesh um our immediate neighbor to look at the thriving garment industry that bangladesh has and to see the employment that they have generated of um of women in particular in the garment industry in bangladesh and the effect that that has had on transforming the country economically and transforming the country also in terms of inclusive growth and in terms of wider spreads of domestic of 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 in of earnings as as many of you would know uh, but for our some of our international colleagues the indian labor market is highly skewed um we have almost complete protection in the formal sector of the economy um and relatively little flexibility in the formal sector of the economy the informal sector of informal labor markets which accounts for 85% of the total workforce in the country has almost complete flexibility and almost no protection we need a balance between these two and the four labor laws that were passed uh just over a year and a half back are actually a step in the right direction they will take us substantially in the direction that we need to go to actually reform our labor laws to make them more inclusive so that they cover a wider section of the total labor market instead of being just this 15% uh, of formally employed people and they also provide for a certain amount of flexibility uh, that will run again across uh, the wider labor force these need to get implemented in a much more effective and speedy way um, both by the union government and by the state governments 
uh, to bring about the kind of objective we want of balancing flexibility and protection for all labor in the country um, as a way of then creating inclusive growth. Uh, lots of potential, lots of work still to be done. Um, and it seems to me it should be one of our top priorities as a country because that's what we need to sustain for a long period of time to bring about, to really create the foundation for labor intensive manufacturing to grow in the country quite substantially. But for it to really grow, um, we also need to make up for mindsets that exist in Indian industry um, that are, if you ask me, anti-large scale labor employment. For whatever reasons, because of the last 50 some years of history, um, most Indian industrialists do not believe that employing more people is a way to be successful. They see instead that employing fewer people, investing in capital intensive manufacturing is actually the way to be successful. It's counter to our factor markets. It's counter to what we need as a country. Changing that legacy, even with the laws having changed, is going to take a lot of change. It's going to take a lot of work. We'll have to be patient and we'll have to work step by step to bring about that change in industrial mindset such that Indian entrepreneurs start seeing labor intensive manufacturing as an attractive option as our friends across the border in Bangladesh see. Um, we don't again have to look far for examples. We can look at Bangladesh, we can look at Vietnam. You will not find examples to a large extent in India uh, of successful large scale labor intensive manufacturing. Just to give you one example from the garment industry, a large garment firm in India employs three to 5,000 people. A large garment firm in Bangladesh employs 30,000 to 50,000 people. It's a one is to 10 difference in terms of the simple scale of employment uh, in the firm. That's what we need to see as our destination. And I think the more we can do to work in an effective way at long-term attractiveness of labor intensive manufacturing, the more we will include uh, in our own economic growth story and our own industrial growth story. It's probably our single biggest, both missed opportunity and our single biggest uh, industrial opportunity uh, going forward. The third point and the last point is on sustainable manufacturing. Clearly, there's a significant role for industrial strategy in, for example, demonstration projects for new technology. This is done widely around the world, including, I think, quite effectively in India. Uh, but I think I'd like to come back to the point that was made again by Mr. Gerd Muller earlier on. The key is implementation, that how do you actually implement in an effective, simple, powerful way um, the adoption of the right sustainable manufacturing technologies that already exist. One is to create new technologies, but second is to use, to diffuse very widely and to adopt the existing technologies because much of the energy conservation um, approaches that he spoke about are not a matter of creating new technology. They're a matter of implementing and diffusing existing technology that is well understood and well understood around the world. So it seems to me that the most effective, simple way of bringing about a real move in the area of sustainable manufacturing is through a serious carbon tax. Uh, a carbon tax that maybe starts at around $25 a ton. Um, I think the world is talking about, more developed countries are talking about $75 a ton. I'd like to see some movement in that direction in terms of actual policies that are being implemented by uh, countries in Europe, countries you know, by the US, by Canada, uh, by Japan. Um, but I think it's in India's interest to actually enact legislation to bring about something like a $25 a ton carbon tax to begin with. Um, and then it can rise over the years. It's the most effective way of ensuring a whole series of things happens. It's the way of ensuring that energy conservation technologies are adopted. It's the way of ensuring that alternate energy, alternate systems to fossil fuels actually diffuse faster and are incentivized automatically because you have a built-in incentive. 
It's the way of actually ensuring that, for example, some of our most, most inefficient um, and polluting coal-fired power plants are more quickly phased out um, because all of that um, would be addressed through something like a serious carbon tax. The reason I'm mentioning this because, you know, many very often when, when, uh, when I'm talking to my industry friends, um, you know, to have an industrialist propose a new tax um, is, uh, seems a little strange. Um, but I think it's the way of actually unleashing um, a lot of the right of the right systems of change um, within industry so that you incentivize the right kind of production, the right kinds of investments um, and the right kinds of capabilities being built. So to close then, um, I think that kind of a package of really thinking through the role of technical capability in anything that we do that has to do with industrial policy and industrial strategy, that the objective is not production, but it's the creation of technical capabilities as a long run legacy that will lead to long run competitiveness for firms. Second, that we look at inclusive growth primarily from the lens of employment creation and employment creation in labor intensive manufacturing as our biggest single missed opportunity in India so far and our biggest single long-term opportunity over the next decades. And second, uh, and third, uh, I think for sustainable manufacturing to really take off, that we actually consider and look at how a, an effective good carbon tax, which would be a relatively simple thing to implement and apply across the board, could actually galvanize investment in this sector. I'll stop there, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Noshad. We expected nothing less from you. This, uh, I think three very well, very powerful points uh, that industrial strategy, when it leads to building up of long-term competitiveness uh, is the one uh, which is likely to be most successful. The inclusive development agenda or inclusive manufacturing really needs to harness the potential of labor intensive manufacturing. And I think it is very brave and courageous of Noshad to say that the mindset of industrialists, uh, industrialists or business people needs to change. And then finally, uh, your point about sustainable manufacturing. And I think uh, advocating for a carbon tax could be the way forward to nudge uh, the uh, businesses and uh, you know all other uh, stakeholders to move towards more sustainable business practices. I think very well made, very powerful points uh, on the agenda of this session. Uh, so with that, uh, I must uh, move on and I want to uh, check with Professor Malhotra if he wants to come in now or towards the end uh, to make the final uh, concluding remark. Oh. So, Professor Malhotra. Uh, uh, Professor Nagesh, I mean, as per your convenience, in fact, at this stage. Okay. I'll go with that. Okay. So, in that case, let us uh, collect some, uh, you know, uh, I can throw uh, the session open now and see uh, who wants to come in in the discussion and invite Professor Malhotra. Uh, at the end uh, for giving his closing remarks. So is that fine, Professor Malhotra? That's fine with me. Okay, excellent. So uh, with this, uh, you know, a uh, number of very solid statements uh, made, uh, you know, uh, from uh, government side, from the industrialists uh, or business or academic side, and uh, then a unit of perspective articulated by uh, D.G. Muller. Uh, incidentally, D.G. Muller had to leave for another engagement, but his deputy uh, is uh, here with us. Uh, is uh, Mr. Hiroshi Kuniyoshi, the uh, managing director uh, in uh, D.G.'s office and his deputy. So uh, he will be handling questions on behalf of uh, D.G. Muller. So uh, I want to now throw uh, the floor open and any questions, please raise hands. Uh, and then I would invite, uh, you know, everyone who is raising hand. Yeah, so I see a hand raised by um, Mr. Ajay Shankar. 
the former industry secretary of india so mr shankar you have the floor uh, my my question is to noshad for said is what are the specific things that government could consider doing which would make indian entrepreneurs comfortable with labor and entering into labor intensive manufacturing and a related question would be what is it that government or what policy instruments could be used to attract fdi into labor intensive manufacturing because you look at the whole spectrum covered under pli they are all good things but certainly labor generation or employment generation is not at the core that of all that has been covered so so any thoughts on that and i mean others can also answer and the other question is that since we haven't yet succeeded in manufacturing so do we have an opportunity to leap from into green manufacturing into the circular economy and therefore emerge in 10 15 years as a slightly better center for manufacturing because we are green we use uh, you know less carbon intensive electricity or carbon free electricity and so on and so forth so is there a genuine opportunity of a late movers a potential advantage or is this just wishful thinking thank you thank you mr shankar i see some more hands on the screen so i want to first collect all the questions before uh, coming to the speakers so i see the hand raised by dr nityananda nityananda is a director of council for social development and he has recently published a book on industrial policy and performance in india so nitya you have the floor thank you um, dr nagesh uh, it was a very interesting discussion from unido head to uh, you know senior official from the ministry as well as uh, dr povis who is possibly among the top most educated industrialist we have and uh, uh, he is a phd uh, you know i uh, as professor nagesh was also uh, talking about uh, my book i find striking similarity uh, of what i um, said in my book and what you uh, said here uh, one difficulty i have you know in terms of say what you say the technical capabilities uh, currently or may likely to reach uh, in their future is very difficult for uh, academician like us because uh, you can take okay how much you spend in energy but that's true a uh, two kind of vague an indicator that might not indicate how technically capable you are some industry might have long history and yet may not be technical capable you know we have seen that so my question is that can you possibly if i say you know identify a few industries where uh, we have good technical capability and with little bit of support uh, from government and from other uh, places you know r and d institutes we can uh, you know uh, kind of help our manufacturers to leap from you know energy is some sector where i'm not very sure because you know we are talking about renewable energy where our own experience is not too long uh, uh, textile and clothing you talked about sharing uh, bangladesh or vietnam where competition is too uh, intensive where i'm not sure it would be to intelligent to get into that uh, field at all so if we find try to find some niche areas where india would have uh, its own capability uh, maybe our industry i don't know you have very capable uh, company you had force muscle which is well known but you know i am not uh, aware of details of those areas uh, of course you also work in the energy sector that's why i know about your presence Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nitya. I see another hand ra being raised by uh, Dr. Mohan Chutani, who is from ISID itself. Uh, Mohan, you have the floor. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, it was a very interesting uh, uh, discussion on uh, industrialization of India. Uh, 
especially post covid i congratulate all the panelists for having uh, raised the uh, you know uh, specific issues that uh, challenge uh, india's industrialization however my immediate question is to uh, noshad uh, dr noshad forbes uh, uh, in as a student of economics uh, i am specifically referring to your second point of inclusive uh, you know uh, uh, growth through uh, you know uh, labor intensive uh, you know uh, uh, and the examples that you gave were of bangladesh and vietnam and so on uh however uh, we uh, as students of economics have been under the impression that there is a trade off between um uh, uh you know uh, labor intensive uh, technology and uh, capital intensive technology in terms of productivity so uh, uh, you know that is the mindset uh, with which uh, you know our industrialists also uh, work around so what solution uh, you would like to give to come around this mind mindset because the uh, uh, solution that you or the suggestion that you have provided is very good uh, because mm -hmm. that is ultimately going to have an inclusive uh, you know uh, development uh, uh, that uh, you know we, india has been wanting for a long time and has not uh, so far been able to you know uh, overcome uh, that barrier so i would end there and uh, thank you very much thank you mohan now i see a hand being raised by sateki roy again my colleague at isid uh, over to you uh, sateki so oh, this is also a question uh, to uh, dr naushad forbes forbes uh, the two uh, points very interesting uh, points that you raised one is that we should look for a more labor intensive kind of industrialization so my question is that in this global scenario uh having china has reached a much larger scale of production and the unit cost is much lower uh, so is it possible to become a second china in manufacturing this question was raised earlier also by many people that do, do we have that option the second is related to the question of technology when you were uh, when you suggested that it is basically to focus on technology Uh, and technological capabilities, which will increase our productive capabilities in the longer run. Now, my question is that in case of India, if you see that in manufacturing the capital intensity has increased very sharply, you also mentioned in your presentation. And is there any choice of technology for industrialists in the sense that when you are facing a global competition, uh, the competition is also in the domestic market? so when you are competing with frontier technologies is it possible to hold back uh, this uh, technological growth and have a labor intensive kind of industrialization thank you uh, sacheki i see that uh, uh, mr narendra reddy uh, yeah. member of uh, isid board is trying to raise her hand so uh, uh, mr reddy uh, you will have the floor Uh, thank you, Dr. Radish. Dr. Mueller suggested out-of-the-box solutions. So, as as one of the out-of-the-box, I propose. You see, the trend of industrialization in India is towards urbanization, very much in urbanization. When I visited Japan 50 years back, the ancillary industry is all. Centered in villages, rural areas. This is not happening in India, so this will solve a problem of many uh, subsequent problems of centralization. So we have to decentralize the industrial development, and attached to that, decentralize energy development. Decentralize energy development using the solar energy and local. Areas should build up a big solar plant and connect it to the decentralized industry. This may help a new trend that will that will that might promote uh, some employment as well as development in other areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reddy. Uh, I now have uh, uh, 
on the screen, uh, Mr. Sanjay, Dr. Sanjay Malik raising his hand. Again, a colleague from IFID. Over to you, Sanjay. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Nawasad Thor. Uh, sir, uh, it is with respect to your second point uh, about uh, the inclusive industrialization in India that you have suggested that uh, we should, uh, industrialists should change their mindset to, you know, to focus on uh, labor intensive manufacturing, basically focusing on the textile and garment industry. But um, I have a little, you know, I am difficulty in accepting that idea. That my question is somewhat, it, uh, somewhat going with the, uh, with uh, Satyaki sir. He has already raised this question, but I'm again, I'm repeating, uh, but li little bit different um, way. So my question that now India is striving for industry for technology, especially robotic technology. And, and the second thing is that the ro price of robot is declining. It is in declining mode. So, but maybe um, uh, 10, 10 year or five year down the line, robot, robot price will come down further. In that, in that situation, uh, given the price of robot is declining, so is it, uh, is it, will it be profitable? Will it incentivize the entrepreneur to go in, you know, uh, investing this labor intensive manufacturing like, you know, textile manufacturing? That is my question to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, we have uh, got some very interesting uh, questions. Most of them addressed to Noshar <laughs> as expected. Uh, so I want to now uh, uh, turn to the speakers. And uh, so uh, Noshar, you have maximum questions, so you might begin. Sure. And then I will invite uh, Kunio Shisan from uh, DG's office. Uh, to respond uh, or add uh, to any of the points that are, that he would like to make. So uh, over to you, Nosha. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for the for the great questions. Um, I think three of the three of the questions were really around labor intensive manufacturing. So I'll kind of combine them. Um, maybe you know the first thing is uh, I think the point that was made. That listen, can you actually, do you have the scope to choose technology? You know, the, the choice of technique, you know, it's a classic. It was, uh, I think it was one of the things that won Amatya Sen the Nobel Prize in economics, right? I mean, the whole choice of technique um, uh, thesis and so on. And the, the um, is it possible really in industry? Uh, and it's an extremely well-placed uh, uh, well placed question. Uh, let me give you let me give you the answers I see it. I don't think I don't know whether choice of technology and choice of technique is indeed possible within an industry. What is possible though is to choose more labor intensive industries. So it's a sectoral choice if you ask me rather than a choice of what technique you use. And if one simply chooses garments and footwear, these still tend to be highly labor intensive sectors, um, wherever in the world they are. I mean, people might talk about new technologies where you have, you know, robots that um, weld, literally weld garments together and sort of sewing them and so on. But as of today, that's not how the world's garments get produced. The way the world's garments get produced as of today um, and for the foreseeable years ahead, the next five, 10 years ahead, is that the bulk of the garments in the world are going to be produced using pretty labor intensive technologies. So picking those sectors, working on those sectors and fostering and making sure one has a successful gum and thriving and growing garment and footwear industry means that one will have a successful labor intensive manufacturing industry. That's the argument that I'm making. So I think it's a industry sectoral choice rather than a choice of technology choice. Um, going with that, uh, the point on China, is it really possible, uh, Satyaki's question, is it really possible to compete with China? Actually, it is. Um, China's wages today, and precisely in labor intensive manufacturing, China's wages today are more than five times India's, um, more than five times India's. Um, that's a huge gap. They're not five times more productive than we are in labor intensive manufacturing. So 
it's entirely possible to compete. And not only is it entirely possible to compete, but what you actually see happening is the migration of labor-intensive manufacturing precisely because of high labor costs out of China. But the migration that's happening is happening from China and it's going to Vietnam, it's going to Bangladesh, it's going to Ethiopia. It's not significantly coming to India. And that's what our role should be. Our role should be to ensure it comes to India. Now, what can the government do? Uh, my friend Ajay's perfect question, right? Uh, what can the government do? Uh, it seems that to me that the government can do um, two things um, in, in a very effective way. One is to ensure that the labor laws, et cetera, et cetera, as we said, get implemented effectively and quickly. So they were, they were passed in September 2020. Uh, some of those notifications are still pending from the union government, uh, you know, 19 months, 20 months later, they should get notified quickly. And then we should be after all the states to notify them such that they can come into effect quickly. So that's the, that's a sort of no brainer. We don't, you know, the law's been passed. It's a matter of getting it notified and implemented. Um, the second thing that the government can do is something that this particular government and our particular current prime minister does better than anyone else, which is he's a great salesman for India in terms of attracting international companies to invest in India. And what I would love to see is I would love to see a strong pitch from the PMO and from our prime minister to two companies to invest in India. Two Indian, sorry, two foreign companies and two Indian companies to invest in India. So first I would like to see Lian Fung in India. Lian Fung is the world's, I believe, largest um, saucer of garments. Uh, they employ hundreds of thousands of people in various factories in China, now increasingly in Vietnam as well. We should say, what would it take for you to have your largest presence in India in whatever time frame? and then do whatever it takes. And second is Foxconn for electronic assembly. Foxconn has come into India, but again, it's good for us to look at some numbers. Foxconn's largest factory making cell phones in China employs 400,000 people, 400,000 people in one factory, 1 1.2 million people employed by Foxconn in China. I mean, these are massive numbers. Samsung employs 100,000 people in its largest cell phone factory in Vietnam. These are massive numbers compared to anything that we have even in our largest factories in India. And that's what we need to find ways of attracting and saying, you know, and I think really that the way in which we've approached getting say an Intel or a Facebook or a whoever to come to India and be active in India, we need to do the same thing with the owners of Lee and Fung, so Mr. Lee and Mr. Fung, <laughs> Mr. Fung anyway, uh, we need to do the same with Foxconn. We need to do the same with a few of these leading garment um, and electronic assembly, highly labor intensive process manufacturing firms in the country. And then there's a second thing that we need to do. You know, we should encourage our prime minister to ask his, his two closest industry colleagues, Mr. Ambani, and Mr. Adani to invest in garment factories, right? If the prime minister asks them, they will not say no, um, but they will not do it on their own. Um, if they do it, it will attract in no, it, it will attract dramatically many other Indian industrialists to see these sectors, to see the garment industry as an attractive industrial opportunity for investment. So if, what can the government do? This is not policy. This is not, this is, this is soft. This is using the soft power of our prime minister uh, to make certain specific things happen. I think that more than anything else will change the mindset of Indian industrialists that this is an attractive thing for us to do. So that would be my, my set of recommendations around labor intensive industry and what we could actually do from the government. The point on, um, technical capability uh, and the role of, uh, you know, that R&D's role is limited. Um, I mean, you're quite right. The, uh, this was the question from uh, Dr. Nityananda. Um, the, you know, 
if you look again at textiles and garments, R&D doesn't matter by and large to industrial success in textiles and garments. It doesn't matter in the area of footwear. A few exceptions like technical textiles and so on, but by and large for the bulk of the industry, it doesn't matter. But it matters in certain other sectors and it matters in the sectors where India has an existing industrial presence. So it matters in pharmaceuticals, it matters in chemicals, it matters in software, uh, it matters in many, it matters in auto, it matters in auto components. These are all engineering. These are all sectors where we have strong Indian industrial, existing Indian industrial presence. And these are all sectors where we need to see a much more substantive investment in in-house R&D by Indian firms. Why does it not happen? I believe it's because um, it's not because we're less profitable. It's not because if anything, it's I think, again, it's because we in Indian industry think we're doing a lot. We think we're doing actually a good job with investing in R&D. We do not recognize that we're investing so little. So I think, so one of the things that we've been trying to do recently is we're running currently actually an R&D managers of the future program. Um, and the idea is to take younger R&D uh, younger R&D managers, people who are going to be running R&D departments in companies. We're doing this for about six companies at present. Um, and we're saying, listen, what would it take to establish a world, a world leading, not world class, world leading R&D facility within your firm? Um, and we're getting them to come back and propose this to us as a group of uh, chief executives and saying, but listen, let's, let's share information across different industries, different companies, and try and see what it would take. And what, what they're finding is that they've started looking at they've started doing benchmarking for their firms. And they're saying, how, many are, how, many, how much do we spend on R&D versus the top 10 or 20 firms worldwide in our industry? How many R&D engineers do they have, do we have? Um, what are their qualifications? What kind of flow of new products do we see coming out from these firms? You start doing that benchmarking and people start becoming clearer of the potential uh, of R&D to really make a difference to the long run success of these firms. So. I think there's lots that we can do. And I think it's, we'll have to work at this step by step until it becomes uh, a movement and a trend that, uh, um, that, applies, that applies across the, across the board. Uh, lastly, uh, a, quick, a quick comment on uh, the point that uh, Mr. Reddy made on uh, Japan and industrial development in Japan being much more rural based. Um, you know, um, here's the comment. I would make two comments on that. First, we should see urbanization is actually a good thing. It's every country around the world, as, they've de as it's developed, it's urbanized. Uh, the fact that 70% of our population in India still lives in rural India is a reflection of relatively poor development over the last 75 years. Um, we should see a more rapid urbanization as actually a good thing because urban agglomerations tend to be more productive. Exactly the point that you made. Now, the question is, why could Japan achieve high productivity, very high productivity with a much greater degree of rural industrialization? And it did achieve it. But their main, by the way, my sense is, my understanding is, that their main objective to achieve it was something called the bullet train. What they tried to do was to destroy distance, um, to destroy the amount of time that it took for people to get from 100 kilometers out of Tokyo, for example, or out of Osaka or whatever, into Tokyo or Osaka. The fact that you can go to Nagoya in 40 minutes or whatever it is, um, is what transformed the economy of Nagoya and tied it into the Tokyo economy so dramatically. And I think that's what we should think about too, that how do we actually reduce the cost of doing business um, 50 kilometers outside of our cities and 100 kilometers outside of our cities? Because if we do, then we can have very productive enterprises located 50 and 100 kilometers out. And it'll be a much more productive development pattern. So I take your point very much. I think it's a very good way for us to think about it. But we should think about things like the bullet train, not as things, not as not as technology that you know 
rich people like me will use to get from Bombay to Ahmedabad. But instead, we should think of bullet trains as a way of bringing rural India into much closer contact with urban India and then letting that dispersed development happen in a much more efficient and faster way. That would be my last comment. Thank you very much, Noshad, for very scintillating uh, responses. I, I think you have clarified many of the things, uh, uh, you know, uh, which uh, earlier came up in your remarks. Now, I see a couple of hands being raised uh, on the screen. So before I invite Mr. Kunioshi, uh, maybe I invite the two uh, gentlemen raising hands. One is Rene Van Barkel from UNIDO, uh, regional office in India, and other is Manish Agarwal. Uh, so uh, Rene, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, uh, I raised my hand because I wanted to also uh, respond a, a little bit from the UNIDO side on some of the comments uh, being made. And uh, sorry for uh, my colleague Hiroshi uh, maybe stepping in front of him. But I, I, I just wanted to make a, a few uh, observations and also respond to some of the questions. So I think Sumita Daura was, was really speaking about uh, creating investment friendly uh, conditions to grasp industrial opportunities. So it's, uh, the role of government is to facilitate, and that, uh, that is really done by, by uh, uh, looking at approval so that you can put plans into action, looking at how finance can flow and, and infrastructure. And uh, as you referred also to this industrial park rating scheme, and that's very much also the work that. You need to also contribute to with this international work on industrial parks, uh, turning uh, special economic zones into innovation and manufacturing hubs, and that is kind of really a trust. Uh, no shot. Uh, I, I think your your three points are very well taken on. Uh, and uh, I particularly uh, would like from, from UNIDO perspective to, to focus on this point of industrial uh, capabilities or in the industrial competitiveness as a, uh, rather than, than just manufacture current items. So to manufacture was something that somebody else has already identified or manufactured will always be put you on the, on the second foot and will not, uh, uh, not, will not put you ahead in the longer term. And that is uh, very much also linked to uh, what, what UNIDO, what uh, DG Müller was also speaking about the digitalization. So our work on uh, the digital transformation has really have highlighted that, that companies that have uh, good productivity, that have industrial capabilities, uh, are the ones who are more, the e economies which are more resilient and also the ones which can better benefit and are more, they, they know what they, to expect from uh, digital technologies and they also set up to benefit from that. Uh, and, and the challenge for, for India, as we see, is then that we have a large segment of the uh, small and medium enterprise I leave out the micro enterprises where uh, perhaps the, uh, the, the, the level of productivity, the level of uh, manufacturing competitiveness, manufacturing capabilities is maybe lagging behind and that is uh, dragging maybe industrial performance also for the larger companies somewhat behind. I mean, there was a, a several comments on the labor intensity. I, I, I personally have a, also a sense of this, that, uh, that labor intensity is of current labor intensity of the sectors is no guarantee for the future. I mean, we, we see now electronics being uh, labor intensive, but uh, five, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, nobody had seen, nobody had really recognized that. We still uh, accept that uh, manufacturing of uh, uh, leather and footwear and, 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 and textiles and garments is labor intensive, but we see also a rapid decline of uh, labor intensity in, uh, in these sectors and there's a lot of innovation happening. I would not uh, like to think in this uh, framework of uh, can India be the second uh, China? I would say why can't India be the first India and, and focus more on the on the, the own uh, capabilities, where are already strengths, and, uh, and that is in, in pharmaceuticals, in chemicals, in automotive, basic metals, and, and software. Uh, so build on those industrial competitiveness to build a manufacturing uh, sector, manufacturing hub. The last point I want to, to maybe highlight is the question on where can, can India jump in the terms of the, the green uh, uh, transformation, and I, I agree with uh, uh, now, that uh, that creating incentives and fiscal incentives could be through a carbon tax that would be probably the most generic instrument that we have for uh, the industrial greening is is something that needs to happen to to jumpstart the the known technologies and also then the the new technologies. Uh, DG was referring to this facility for low carbon technology deployment where we work with Indian innovators to do new things and uh, bring new innovations and not necessarily new to the world or or, or rocket science applied, but 
uh, in many cases, good engineering, good engineering application of things which are known, like phase change materials or waste heat recovery, and then doing innovations, innovation from India, uh, uh, which, which we, we supported to, to, to introduce phase change materials in cold chains. They are now uh, being exported as phase change materials for for building uh, applications in, in, in the Netherlands, in Europe. So we see that even by focusing on the on, on green applications for the knowledge which India has on, uh, on chemicals and materials can actually open new opportunities for, uh, for export-driven manufacturing growth. Uh, so maybe with uh, that, I, I hand you back. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Rene. Uh, Mr. Manish Agarwal, you have to be very quick because we have really run out of time. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you for such a uh, interesting and engaging discussion. My name is Manish Agarwal. I, I am working with the Institution of Engineers India. Earlier, I was with the Quality Council of India, QCI, which is an autonomous body under the DIPP Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So actually, my question goes to Mr. Noshad. Actually, he, uh, he suggested that uh, India can also levy uh, a carbon tax or uh, you can say green tax on the industry to nudge them into adopting... Uh, uh, green clean technology uh, which uh, doesn't affect the climate and uh, so basically uh, what I want to say is that uh, already QCI is running a scheme uh, uh, PM Modi's uh, brainchild uh, that zero defect zero effect which means that uh, manufacturing uh, 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 zero defect products uh, quality products that uh, which have uh, zero negative effect on environment environment friendly products so it is for the MSME industry. So we uh, QCI is running as that zero defect, zero effect certification MS, uh, certification scheme for the MSME industry. Um, uh, so basically, the discussion is about the uh, sust uh, for uh, su uh, promoting sustainable industri uh, industrial development in India. Uh, so my question is that already the Indian industry uh, manufacturing companies they are suffering. Uh, due to the uh, uh, prolonged uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, for last two and a half years or more, uh, and still its after effects are continuing. So will it be feasible to levy such a uh, uh, tax, uh, carbon tax or green tax, uh, what is being suggested? Because uh, already the government of India okay. uh, is having uh, a system money. of incentives and yeah. incentives in place to uh, yeah. uh, for industry to adopt uh, clean right. technology. So right. that is my question to Mr. Nye. Maybe, uh, maybe a polluting industry like chemical industry is the maybe defaulter industry um, because they are uh, chemical industry is supposed to yeah. be the most... Yeah. Uh, you are very clear. Thank yeah. you, Manish. Thank you. Uh, Noshad, you want to quickly respond to uh, his... One point? sentence. Just one sentence because I want to actually hear Professor Malhotra. So, <laughs> so the, so the uh, you know, just the one sentence would be that I'm not suggesting that we should impose the carbon tax tomorrow, right? Um, but we can certainly, you know, and especially not on the back of very rapidly rising oil prices. So the oil prices that have risen really rapidly have been a very good shock, uh, actually, uh, in the in the last in the last two months. Um, and that is having the right effect in terms of getting industry to invest in the right kinds of energy saving programs and so on. Um, I would wait. I would wait maybe six months or a year uh, and for the right time and then bring the tax in. Yeah. So, it, yeah, I, I, but I'll stop. I'll stop there. Thank, really thank you, Nota. The uh, now I uh, turn to Mr. Kuniyoshi-san uh, from Unido. Of course, your colleague uh, from Delhi has already responded and made a number of remarks on behalf of Unido. But if you want to add uh, anything to what uh, Rene had just said, please feel free. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I really enjoyed the discussions. And say, as you already suggested, that the, the, our Director General presented uh, his views uh, rather extensively. And also our unit representative in Delhi, uh, Rene Van Bakel, uh, already uh, made the interventions. So basically, uh, from my side, say nothing to add. I just want you to repeat that say our uh, cooperation history uh, with India is uh, quite long and strong, and we are quite active in India uh, now. And also uh, with the new Director General Gad Mura, uh, of course we will keep the uh, Union's mission, inclusive and sustainable industry development, but with uh, 
a bit, a little different priorities, which uh, God Miller already explained. And we are looking forward to working together and also uh, discussing uh, like today. And our focal point will be uh, our uh, representative, uh, Rene Van Bakel. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Kunio Shisan. And uh, we really uh, look forward to very intensive and much more invigorated uh, partnership with UNIDO going forward in the context of inclusive and sustainable industrialization of India. Thank you very much. So now I turn to uh, Professor Malhotra, uh, the member secretary of Indian Council of Social Science Research to deliver his uh, closing remarks. Uh, over to you, Professor Malhotra. Uh, thank you, Professor Kumar. Uh, it was indeed wonderful listening to all, all such people in fact, who have been contributing at their level in policy making, they have been interacting with the policy makers all across the world. Uh, my compliment should go to ISID also. Uh, that institute has under your leadership taken the lead to organize such a, such a discussion on industrial strategy for the post pandemic era, uh, scaling up the inclusive and sustainable manufacturing transformation. Uh, in fact, I felt on this occasion that Institute for uh, studies in industrial development became almost synonymous to inclusive and sustainable industrial development on, on this platform. So uh, this rhyming of the names, in fact, that gave us a sense that we are talking about inclusive and sustainable industrial development at ISIT. And it definitely raises a very pertinent point that in days to come, ISIT can definitely take a lead in such inclusive and sustainable aspect of industrial development. And I, I think this is where UNIDO and uh, ISID could collaborate also a little more intensively. Uh, of course, number of new ideas have emerged in these discussions today. Uh, uh, Mr. Grad Mueller talked about digitalization, green industry and rebalancing of global value chain. A uh, number of new initiatives taken by the government of India were in fact uh, talked about by uh, Ms. Sumita Davra and uh, Noshad did raise in fact number of points which must have and did, these did invite uh, let's say a lot many questions. I, I understand that questions always remain unsaid because it takes very long period of time to discuss all these issues in detail. Uh, but few of the points that he very pertinently made uh, and which I find very interesting are that industry should be offering something from its side, even as tax packages. So this, this was a wonderful point and that definitely makes sense at this platform because the fact that lot many issues during COVID period or even post-COVID period are coming up, which relate to profiteering by industry. So I think that, that is a very, very strong point. Secondly, in India, we, we know that researchers, uh, investment on researchers, they have been lagging far behind. We invest less than 0.7% of our GDP on research and development activity. And the, the share of the industry far lesser than what it happens to be there in many advanced countries. We know there are countries like Israel and South Korea, which are investing more than four to 4.5 percent of GDPs uh, on research and development activities itself. So it's a very strong point. I think we suffer from somewhere uh, this uh, this feeling that perhaps uh, investment in researches are not all that profitable, which perhaps direct production is at 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 this stage in the country. And I think it needs to be a slightly much more researched in. and thereafter only India would definitely be moving towards NEP 2020 could be definitely a path setter in this direction, which talks about taking this investment from 0.7% to initially 1.1 or 1.2%, and then over a period of 15 to 20 years, taking it further to more than 2%. Of GDP. Uh, when the issue of uh, uh, the, the wage rate of Chinese labor uh, 
uh, which is said to be five times more than India, it came up. I, I did think in terms of their skill sets also to be talked about because productivity is, when we talk of the wage rates, we must at the same time talk of the, the productivity differentials also. Uh, so I think that is, that, is, that is very, very important. Uh, what I understand when I go through the UNIDOS for enabling functions, uh, which are about technical cooperation, analytical and research functions in policy advisory services, and normative functions and standard and quality related activities, and convening and partnership for knowledge transfer, networking, and industry cooperation. I think this is where the scope for the collaborative activities between institutes like ISID or ICSSR or any developmental institutions or the policy makers at any stage of uh, their careers, in fact, uh, exists. And this is where the second issue in particular, analytical and research functions and policy advisory services. This is, I would propose that where more engagements in days to come can take place. Uh, with these remarks, I know the job of uh, moderator is more difficult in such panel discussions, who to start with and who and where to stop somebody saying one's point, in fact. But uh, Professor Nagesh Kumar has done it wonderfully well and uh, his own understanding of the industry and his uh, credentials in industry-related research definitely has helped him handling it a little more. But of course, as I said, any intellectual discussion, more than it reaches its fruition and completion, it remains unsettled for the next time. With these remarks, I would stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Malotra. I think a very, uh, very thoughtful, very insightful remarks. And also, uh, you know, your uh, suggestions that uh, we really look into the coaches and regions why Indian industry is not attuned to doing uh, R&D activity in greater proportion. I think uh, research on opportunity cost of not doing uh, enough R&D is very much uh, uh, critical. We, we will uh, do that and we will work on it. And you driving us uh, in uh, to greater engagement on these policy issues uh, on uh, industrial strategy and working closely with the uh, uh, UNIDO colleagues uh, is certainly very well taken and we will uh, really engage all different stakeholders uh, within the government, within the multilateral system like UNIDO and uh, uh, business people, industrialists, uh, like our friend, Nosha. So uh, with that, uh, it is now my turn uh, to thank everyone. I just want to check if uh, Mr. Mishra, uh, our chairman, wants to uh, say anything at this stage. Sir, you are muted. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's getting help. Yeah, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, uh, Nagesh. Well, at the outset, I must compliment you, Nagesh, for organizing this event. Very well organized with a galaxy of distinguished speakers who have contributed substantially to freshness of thinking on the issues that uh, were to be discussed in this forum. I'm also happy that you invited Mr. Muller to deliver the keynote address. Mr. Muller in his very incisive speech has highlighted the challenges that have to be met urgently ensuring implementation of decisions. Imp implementation is the key in every sphere. Now, he has, he has referred to uh, the need for focusing on rural development, raising of incomes, necessitating out-of-box thinking, innovative approach to problems, development of new technologies, challenges arising of global warming, need to focus on industrial greening, and problems relating to food security. These are all 
very vital uh, issues which uh, need considerable uh, thinking and action. Dr. Nosad brought a great freshness of thinking, and I'm glad he raised this question of labor intensive thing. I have myself been uh, wondering why we as a nation, with our very rich uh, rural craft traditions, in the handloom sector and the other craft sector, why have we not been able to match Bangladesh? And I think what uh, Nasha Sahib has raised the issue of uh, labor intensive. When he talks of labor intensive, it is not to the exclusion of those areas where we have strengths. We continue with them. It's not that we give those up. And uh, I think that it, it will make a huge difference to employment, uh, uh, generating further employment. And I think his approach is very sound in getting two uh, outstanding uh, uh, companies from abroad and getting the two biggest industries over here. If they are involved, it will have a catalytic effect on the others. And imagine, I, I think we can match Bangladesh, we can match China. So we, we continue with what we are doing, but bring in uh, uh, new investors, even uh, uh, existing uh, in, uh, leaders of the industry, they also get into the sector. And, and where most of these uh, uh, activities are centered in the rural areas, makes it a difference to the economy of the rural sector. The point that he has raised, I think it uh, has not occurred to anybody because there are more critics about the bullet train. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it never struck me and this is a new uh, angle to it and a very positive uh, thinking that because of the bullet train, it has brought urbanization a rural thing to the uh, urban sector and brought them closer. And that is the biggest advantage. And what you said, it, it should not be confined to uh, Bombay, Ahmedabad. It should be a linkage with the rural uh, sector. That, that is an important uh, element. Also, I think there is need, and in every country, Ch China is doing it, Japan is doing it in a big way, the need for R and strengthening R and D, we must put in more funds in R and D. One point that Ajay Shankar has raised is very uh, relevant. We should ask and and uh, decide what is it that we expect from the government. Also analyze what has the government done so far. What are the measures they have done? To what extent? they have achieved the results that they were designed to achieve. And if not, why not? What needs to be done to ensure better results? What needs to be done to bring about better implementation? I think ISID, ISID can play a role in that. ISID can set up a task force to look into these things, mm -hmm. to also see uh, about the implementation of decisions taken by government and act as advisor, uh, uh, advisor role to the government, telling them that these are the areas that need to be uh, looked into. This is, these are the reasons why the policy enunciated has not worked or is not producing the results. And whether there is need for uh, change of policy or modification of policy. I think these are some of the, the thoughts that occurred to me. And once again, I compliment you. I compliment all the speakers, Professor Marotra, Marshal, the DG and his representatives, representative from the uh, government of India, and all the participants from the audience. So thank you once again, and good luck. Thank you very much, sir. I think uh, you have really uh, picked up uh, some very important points that came up in the discussion. I felt like, uh, you know, this discussion that we started nearly two hours ago, could continue forever. And it's just so engaging and rich. And for that, I think we are all indebted to uh, the DG Mueller. Uh, and I would request uh, uh, Kun uh, Kuniyoshi-san, uh, his deputy, to carry 
our uh, you know uh, expression of gratitude to him and of course we will remain in touch with the uh, unido uh, headquarters and also the with the regional office based in delhi uh, our uh, distinguished panelists uh, you know both uh, ms davra and uh, Dr. Forbes uh, added uh, very rich insights from their respective, uh, you know, uh, sort of sectors or sides. Uh, one from the government and policy making, and the other uh, the uh, practitioners' insights, uh, very rich uh, or indeed. And uh, Professor Malotra, uh, you know, bringing a very interesting insights uh, from uh, his, uh, you know, uh, the role as a, a you know, sort of. Uh, uh, you know, promoter of uh, research in the country, social science and economic research in the country, and he his advice uh, on how do we take it forward, uh, you know, from this discussion. So all uh, of this was very interesting and useful discussion, and so we are very grateful to all of you and all the participants who uh, asked engaging questions. And, uh, you know, and uh, to the chairman uh, himself driving this uh, discussion. So thank you very much indeed. We uh, like every good thing, you know, it has to come to an end. But we will continue uh, with this kind of engagement with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nagesh. Thank you.